Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin, and we are the Queen's Genetically Engineered Machine Team. Over the past decade, sustainability, environmentalism, and pollution are words that we hear more and more frequently. As we become more aware of these issues, the pressure is on for industries to develop sustainable practices. However, the demand for oil, pharmaceuticals, and other products is certainly not decreasing. Our environment is beautiful, balanced, and synchronized. As our population grows and develops, we keep taking more and more from the environment, disrupting the balance each time until we reach total collapse. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. And I believe that's why a lot of us are here today. Our project is focused on chimeric protein engineering to enhance manufacturing and bioremediation, helping us reduce our impact on the environment and fix the damage that we've already caused. A lot of considerations need to go in the design of chimeric proteins. First, as usual, we have to start with their sequence. Within our DNA sequence, we have to check for biobrick cut sites so that we don't accidentally cut apart our biobrick template. Next, in our mRNA sequence, we have to check for rare codons so that our protein is synthesized at a normal rate, and for stop codons so our protein is coded in full. We also have to make sure that we haven't incorporated any frame shifts when combining different parts. And these are some of the reasons why the current biobrick standard is incompatible with chimeric protein design. There are several existing standards for chimeric protein design, some of which are compatible, some simple, and some more complex. Initially, we even worked on developing our own standard for making ligations based off the current standard. However, it ended up having a lot of the same issues as the current standard. In the end, we chose to work with the BB2 standard proposed by Tom Knight for its simplicity and its benign ligation scar. However, the best cloning method, which used most, was PCR overlap extension. Not only did we use this to stitch together chimeric parts, but we also used this to rapidly switch insertion sequences in just one reaction. So basically, the way this works is by having complementary sequences on either side of your insert, you can amplify around the whole plasmid, then digest the template plasmid, and immediately transform the resulting part, giving you a brand new chimeric protein. Our parts are designed for this method. Slimpy digest, gel purify, extend, and transform, giving you your new chimeric protein. And we're in the process of submitting an RFC for this method, so you guys can keep an eye out for that. In our protein sequence, we have to make sure that each part, such as linkers and coding domains, have been incorporated properly. The last thing that you have to take into account is the protein structure itself and its stability. You have to know of any issues in expressing each of the chimeric parts within your chassis. The product may not fold properly or from occlusion bodies. You also have to consider the resulting structure of your protein. 3D protein structures are extremely useful in determining this. Which is why, from our wiki, we've created a mini-guide introducing you to Pymol so you can build your 3D protein structures and Gromax, which will let you simulate how they react in a box of water. This will give you a bit of insight as to whether or not your resulting protein structure will survive or fall apart. And now this science stuff is pretty awesome. But we also discovered something else, a little bit more fun. What we realized is that it's actually really easy to incorporate 3D protein structures into a flight simulator. <laughs> so from our website, you'll find uh, links to an open source flight simulator called Flight Gear, as well as a guide and some of our own maps and challenges. Now this might seem a little bit ridiculous, <laughs> but this could actually become a really great learning tool for 3D protein structure. And this could lead into the development of a game sort of like Eterna or Folded, where you're solving puzzles to actually contribute to scientific data. So for example, imagine instead of flying your plane, 
you're flying a ligand into the active site of a protein. Then this would contribute to drug discovery. But now we'll talk about, about flagella. Generally, bacteria can have one or multiple flagella in different arrangements, which will rotate in one direction to move forwards, and in the opposite direction to induce a tumble, which will turn the cell in a random direction. If we take, take a look at an E. coli flagellum, it is made up of monomers called flagellin. And there's about 20,000 of them. Each flagellin can be divided up into three different domains. Two of these are constant domains that are necessary for polymerization. And one of these is a variable domain, which contributes to some stability, but has no known function otherwise. What we did is we took this variable domain made insertions, or replace it entirely as we designed our chimeric protein scaffold. So now I'll get into some of our results. Naturally, the first constructs that we made were with fluorescent proteins. And these made excellent templates for doing PCR overlap extension because you could select for any colonies that may have retransformed any undigested template plasmid. So you shine your filtered light on your plates and select for the colonies that aren't glowing. And from our results, we found um, fluorescence in both our insertion and deletion variants of Chimera, more so in our insertion variant. And in the motility assay, we found motility in our deletion variant, but no motility in our insertion variant. So this can mean a few different things, and we'll definitely need more research. But one thing could be that uh, if the RFP molecules are being arranged on the scaffold, you're getting a quenching effect, hence the decrease in fluorescence. Next. We looked at catalysis. We started by taking the enzyme Zal E from the Biobank registry and incorporating it into our flagella. And this enzyme degrades catechol, a building block in organic synthesis to give a yellow color. For bioremediation, we looked at dehalogenases. Haloalkanes are mass produced chemicals commonly used in flame retardants, pharmaceuticals, as well as other applications. However, they are toxic, carcinogenic, and can accumulate in the food chain. We built flagellin chimeras using dehalogenous enzymes from two different species of bacteria that will degrade haloalkanes by reducing and hydrolyzing the carbon halogen bond. From our results, we found motility in both of these dehalogenase constructs. However, we have not had a chance to test for ectolysis. The next chimera we researched comes from the cellulolytic bacteria Clostridium thermocellum. What this bacteria does is it creates an extracellular scaffold for enhanced cellular digestion. The scaffold consists of cohesins, which act as thoughts, to which another domain called a docrin can bind. These docrins are combined with enzymes so that they can be arranged on the scaffold to enhance cellular degradation. The system consists of three main parts. First is the type two docrin and cohesin, which anchor the larger scaffold to the cell. Second, are the cohesins themselves, which are also combined with a cellulose binding domain. And third are the enzymes, which are arranged on the scaffold that actually do the cellulose digestion. And this system is really amazing because you can take these cohesins and actually rearrange them, resulting in ordered chimeric scaffolds. So introducing this entire system to E. coli would be incredible but difficult. Our method potentially provides an excellent alternative. What we did is we took the type two cohesin and docrin, combined the cohesin with our flagella, and combined the docrin with an RFP and a secretion tag. From our results, we found motility in the cohesin construct, and we we're just one ligation away from having the docrin RFP construct. And the nice thing about this Docrin construct is that it's designed in the same way as our flagellin sequences, so we can use PCR overlap extension and switch out that RFP for something useful, like an enzyme or a binding protein, in just one simple reaction. Another thing that we worked on between the regional and the final jamboree was that uh, we got our hands on a flagellin deletion variant of E. coli. Uh, so after expressing all of our constructs in these uh, bacteria, what we found is that our flagellin construct expressed motility as expected. However, 
um, in all of our uh, chimeric constructs, we didn't get any fluorescence. So this is a little bit dis disheartening, but um, what we did notice is that uh, compared against the RFP uh, control, which is just a specific radio RFP protein, uh, the cell density is more arranged closer and tighter to the inoculation spot, whereas when we're looking at the RFP deletion, the fluorescence is actually more towards the outside. And we, should, we, sh we wish we had a picture to show you this, but um, we'll have to post that later. So our goals are still a lot higher than this, but we've laid the foundation. The advantage of cloning using our method is that it lets you easily and efficiently build new chimeric parts. So further testing will, will take relatively less time, and to incorporate new enzymes from nature, all you need is a couple primers. Under the right conditions, we believe that our flagellant constructs will lead to a new tool in manufacturing and bioremediation. Think about it. This is a large extracellular scaffold. So you can arrange multi-enzyme pathways in close proximity. On top of that, it's motile. So it's actually microscopically stirring itself in solution. And we can take this idea and apply it to other systems, such as surface display. So imagine arranging your bacteria by binding the flagella to each other or to binding proteins on another cell surface. Another application that's currently being developed is the synthesis of nanotubes. By binding metals to the outside of the flagella, they can be arranged to form a cylinder. The flagella can then be destroyed, leaving a uniform tubular structure. And another thing that we can look at is other microorganisms flagella such as eukaryotic or archaeoflagella, which have very different structures and may have more advantages. And then we can take this idea more generally and look at other cell structures. For example, in 2010, the Agent team from Slovenia used DNA as a scaffolding molecule, which was a part of our inspiration. But there's definitely a lot more out there that we can check out. Over the course of the summer, we've learned all the difficulties and uh, considerations that need to be made in, in the design of chimeric proteins. So one of the aims of our wiki is to provide a basis for all of this information so that future iGEM teams can spend less time planning and more time cloning when they want to build their chimeric proteins. What we've proven this summer is that you can easily and efficiently build chimeric proteins. In fact, all of the parts that we've shown you today were cloned in about a month. This is the start but we want to see so much more. Using our method, we, we have the resources and intend to clone 20 new chimeric insertion sequences, which will result in 60 new chimeric parts in just a few days' work. Additionally, we're in the process of submitting modularized parts for doing traditional ligation methods. So at the start of the summer, uh, we decided that we were going to use dance to demonstrate our research. So initially, since hardly any of us had, had any dance experience, we started by just making a simple video demonstrating our favorite method, PCR. <laughs> <laughs> However, we also wanted to see how far we could actually take this. So we got in touch with the Queens and Kingston dance community, met up with a group of dancers, danced, and learned from each other to become the unique combination that you see here today. Both of these projects have held some of the most difficult and daring challenges that our team has faced, and has been a truly long and crazy journey to get to this point. And so we're very happy to have shared both of these things with you today. For that, we would like to thank the Oil Sands Leadership Initiative, as well as our other sponsors, for all of their support. We'd like to thank the research labs from all around the world for, help with, for helping us find some of our DNA, as well as some of our bacteria. Uh, we'd like to thank the our, our the Queens and Kingston dance community um, for their help, uh, along with our choreographer, Devin Ryan, and our dancers. We'd like to thank our press advisors, in particular Dr. Chen Sang and Dr. Bandana, uh, for their support. Thank you to our iGEM team and volunteers, especially those who could not make it here today. Thank you, iGEM. And lastly, thank you all for your attention, and hope that you've enjoyed our presentation.